that's good. Perfect. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, so my name is Katie Potts. As Liana said, I work at the Natural History Museum in London. And I've been working here for around six, I say here, I'm not here, this is, this is my bedroom. <laughs> but um, I've been working there for around six years um, on a number of different projects, such as the ID Trainers project. And then I worked in the Beatles section on African Beatles for a few years, which was incredible, really fun. And now I work in the Angela, Mar Mar Angela Marmont Centre, I can never say that properly, for UK biodiversity, working on a project called Brilliant Butterflies. So we look at chalk grassland invertebrates and we're investigating how we can um, use new molecular technologies to survey invertebrate populations on chalk grasslands. So we're working on developing these methods so that they can be best used to inform conservation practices on nature reserves. And I'm also one half of the Longhorn Beetle Recording Scheme. So I managed the scheme with Will Heaney, who some of you may know. Um, he's a great guy and we create, we collate all the Longhorn records um, that get sent into the scheme. So we want to try and encourage people to record longhorns more and hopefully some of you will take up longhorn beetle recording after this workshop today. So shout in the comments if anything is confusing because do I can elaborate on things as we go along but um, I just want to talk through some of the very basic taxonomy just in case we've got some viewers that are new to this like I think we've got a couple of beginners here which is great and um, I know this is going to be on YouTube afterwards as well, so it's good to give an overview before we start so that people know what I'm talking about. So we generally classify animals and plants on the basis of shared morphological characteristics. So this means that we place them in a hierarchy of groupings based on how similar they look. So we start at the top with a broad sort of overarching morphological similarity and then the closer we get to the species, um, the more specific the sim similarities get. So if we look at the example that we've got here, so this is a lovely longhorn beetle, root pella maculata. Um, so we know, we can see that it's an animal, so it belongs in the kingdom Animalia. So you can follow me along as we go down this little list. And then it's in the phylum Arthropoda, because it's got these jointed appendages. I can never say that word properly, bent appendages. Um, and then they're in the class Insecta, this one here, because they've got six legs, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then three body segments. So they've got the head here, and then the thorax, <coughs> and then the abdomen. So that's how we know it's an insect. And then we, we move further down the little funnel, and it's in the order Coleoptera, which is this one here, because it's got biting mouth parts and you can't actually see them in this picture. <laughs> it's a bit of a bad picture to pick. And then it's got these hardened wing cases, which we call elytra. And I'm going to keep saying that word throughout the whole day. So the hardened wing cases are called the elytra. And then we move further down and this is the level we're looking at today. So we're at family level, which is the longhorn beetles or Cerambycidae. And we'll discuss the key features of that shortly. And then as we move further down the taxonomic levels, we get to genus and species and the characteristics just become more specific until we reach our species, where all the individuals have the same morphology at species level. And like I say, do shout if things don't make sense. So longhorn beetles, Sarambicidae. So longhorn beetles are placed within the order Coleoptera um, because of these biting mouth parts in the elytra which are called the hardened wind cases. And they sit within their own family called Cerambycidae. And this in Greek just means horned. And the common name, as the common name suggests, they've got long antennae. Um, they tend to fold them back over the body. Um, during this presentation, I'll flip between using the, the terms Cerambycidae and longhorn beetles, just so you can get used to hearing both. So there's around 30,000 species worldwide. Um, always these estimates are, people argue around the estimates because you never really know what's out there. We've got so many more species to discover. Um, we have around 69 species on the British list that are considered to be native or naturalised in Britain. Um, again, people argue about that number. We won't go into that today. Um, 
so non-native species are often recorded as one-off one records. Um, quite often they'll emerge from imported wood within the timber trade. And in the past couple of years, we've had new species of longhorn that have become naturalised in Britain. So we've got Agapanthia cardui, which is a new species of Agapanthia, which was found in Kent. Um, and that's now establishing itself in other little populations from its original one, which is really exciting. Um, so to the ID features, this family is characterised by being medium sized beetles and they have these sort of rectangular cylindrical type shaped bodies and they're generally quite robust beetles as well. So even when you see the tiny small dainty ones, when you look at them under a microscope, they still are pretty robust. Um, and in most species, although the two pictures I've picked for this slide, this is, can't, doesn't make sense for us, but in most species, the antennae are around the same length as the body. But there are a number of species where they're longer than the body. So for example, um, in Aromia muschiata, the musk beetle here, and also Leopis. And then some species like Ragium, which we'll come to you later, there, um, they have the antennae quite short for a longhorn beetle, um, and also Hylotropes bajulus also has that. Um, so, on to the next slide. So, longhorn beetle morphology isn't really that different from the rest of the beetles. So, they have these hardened wing cases, which you can see here. And beetles used to have two pairs of wings, and then they evolved these um, hardened wing cases over the top. I think that's one of the main reasons why they're so successful, um, beetles in general, because they've got this like armour around them, essentially. Um, there's over 400,000 described species worldwide, so they're doing something right. <laughs> um, so yeah, they have these hardened wing cases, which we call the elytra, and then biting mouth parts, which again, I haven't, um, it doesn't illustrate that on this, picture but just imagine little mandibles at the front. Um, so those are the two key features of the beetles. But what's really characteristic to the longhorns are the long antennae. So yeah they tend to have these long antennae that they fold back over the back. Um, this overall sort of robust body shape. Um, a couple of other things to note actually while we've got this um, illustration up is that here we call the thorax in the beetle world we call it the pronotum so that's just a little term to remember and hopefully it doesn't confuse you so the thorax is called the pronotum and the second term is where the elytra meets here along the midline so it's just where the two wing cases meet we call that the suture so I'll, I'll refer to that a few times and then another feature to mention is the scutellum here which is just a little triangle, kind of a triangle shaped structure on the body. It's, I guess it's like the hinge or the joint for where the, the wings meet. And um, that's a very important for a couple, well, that's an important feature for a couple of species too. So the last ID feature I want to talk about for family level ID is the tarsi, which is like the beetle equivalent to the feet. So this section here is the tarsi. You can see it drawn here. Um, so if you have a beetle and you're not sure if it's a longhorn beetle or not, a useful tip for determining identification can be to look at the tarsi. Um, it's easier to do this if you pop the specimen in a pot. You can try and look at the tarsi then if you can get them to stay still enough. <laughs> you can actually pop, pop a little bit of tissue paper in sometimes that helps and gives them something to hold on to, or like a flower. Um, like there, I can't actually see myself, so I don't know if I'm showing that in the right spot. Um, so if you look at this enlarged image on the right hand side here, so we've got the last segment of the leg is the tarsi there. So that's the femur, that's the tibia, and then this whole section is called the tarsus. And then the tarsus is made up of these small little segments called tarsal segments. And something that tends to, I find tends to confuse people quite a lot is the claw. So you can't really see the claw on this one, but sometimes people get confused and think that section is the claw. Like the claw sort of sits on the, that's not really doing a very good job, but it sits on the end. Um, so just be mindful of that. 
um, so yeah, the tarsus is made up of these smaller segments and in beetle identification, the number of tarsal segments in the tarsi across all the different types of beetle ranges from around three segments um, up to five. So the number of tarsal segments can be really useful to count. So we count the number of tarsal segments on each leg. So we'd count this leg, the front leg, we'd count the mid leg, and then we'd count the hind leg. So this is a longhorn beetle here. So you can't really see the picture very well, but I promise you there's four segments, so it will look like this. One, two, three, four. And we write it like four on the front leg, four on the mid leg, four on the hind leg. So we call that the tarsal formula. Um, so it's a key identification character for longhorns. But as with all things in identification, people may, you may have come across this, there's always exceptions and there's always strange little rules. So I say the four, they have four, 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 as in four tarsal segments per leg with a word of warning because they don't. It looks like they have four, but they actually have five segments on each leg. Um, they have this hidden tarsal segment that sits behind one of the other tarsal segments. So you can see that here. So it looks like that, but it's never that easy to see, I promise you. Um, and so basically they just have this hidden tarsal segment and we call this pseudotetramerous. Pseudotetramerous. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, so you're probably thinking, why are you telling me about this, this seems quite complicated. Well, there's a number of, there's two other families that um, can be commonly mistaken for beetles. So, um, for longhorn beetles, sorry. Um, so it's a good, good to get a general feel for how the different groups look as you're trying to learn identification. But it's not very helpful when you're starting off. Sometimes you just need that defining character that you can use to tell them apart while you're trying to get your eye in for them. So, um, Let's have a little look at two examples of other beetles that look similar. So some of you that may have looked at longhorns before or have been looking at beetles may think it's really easy to tell these apart um, and that you can just see the general difference. And I do see that, but when you're starting at the beginning, it's really tricky to separate them. And I can remember confusing um, thick leg flower beetles and lots of soldier beetles with longhorns when I first started out. Um, so if you just have that one feature that you can use to double check, it's always really helpful. Um, so yeah, so we have the Cantharidae on this side here, and then we have the Edomeridae here. And we get so many records of Cantharids and Edomerids into the scheme when people think they're longhorns. So it's quite, quite important to tell the difference. And quite often in collections, you see um, lots of Cantharids and Edomerids in the Serambicid jaws. So it's important. So you can see on these photos on the left here, um, this is the Cantharid, the soldier beetle. And it has five, one, two, three, four, five. And you can see the little claw in the end there. So it's got five tarsal segments on the front leg. It's five tarsal segments on the middle. One, two, three, four, five. Those little heart shaped ones um, can be sometimes people count them as two because they think they're two little, two little separate ones, but they're not. They're just one. So one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five. So we know our soldier beetles have five tarsal segments per leg. So if you can, it may seem like you wouldn't be able to use a hand lens and check the tarsal, look at the tarsi, but you actually can. I, I've done this so many times. So if you have a good hand lens, you can use it to try and count them. Um, and then the same with the, the flower beetle here, the Edomerid. They have five, five, four. Um, so five, five, four. So be careful with these families. And if we just compare all three here, we can see that the longhorn beetle has four, four, four. You can't really see that in that picture. To be fair, I should have picked a better one. Um, I hope that wasn't too confusing. So that's how you would if you thought, oh, do I have a soldier beetle or have I got one of these flower beetles? I'm not sure with whether it's a longhorn or one of these three. If you can capture it, pop it into a pot and then use a hand lens to try 
and count those feet or if you take the specimen to um, identify with a microscope if you have one it's very easy so that's a really nice character to split them and then our other longhorn lookalike is the subfamily of leaf beetles so leaf beetles are in the family chrysomelidae and um, yeah these are phylogenetically the closest beetle family to longhorns um, and they have like they both have 444 appearance of the tarsi um, they are both that pseudo tetramerous where they've got the hidden tarsal segment but don't worry about that too much I only I only mention it because in a lot of books they'll refer to longhorn beetles as having 555 so I just want to make it clear before I confuse you um, so these are Donaceae, um, these are the little type of leaf beetle here and they quite often get confused for longhorns. And if you look at, look at the top here at the pronotum, I mean, it, they're quite parallel sided in the pronotum. So longhorns tend to be a bit more either completely sort of rounded or they tend to be a bit more sort of tapering downwards um, or tapering upwards, sorry. Um, yeah, so if you look at the pronotum here, they're ever so slightly wider at the top. I, it's hard to actually see sometimes if you sort of stare at it for a little while, you can see that it's ever so slightly wider at the top. Um, and the eyes are very different. So they've got very small eyes in this subfamily of leaf beetles. Um, longhorns tend to have more sort of kidney shaped eyes. Um, we have had a couple of records of this, these, this family of leaf beetles where a recorder think that it's Dinoptera colaris, which is a really rare longhorn anyway. Um, so just bear that in mind. So if you're confused um, and you, you see something that's got the same tarsal formula 444 as a longhorn beetle, you can just have a look at the shape of the pronotum and the different heads, head, sort of head shape. It just looks very different. The head it looks flatter here. Um, and the eyes are very different as well. I hope the tarsal formula stuff isn't confusing. I can answer some more questions about it in the question section if you, if you need to. So like all other beetles, longhorns have a holometabolous life cycle, which means they go through a complete metamorphosis, right through from the egg, which is this bit here, right through from larvae through to the adult stage. So the life cycle begins, the female lays her eggs in substrate um, and the larvae, once they've hatched, they feed. Um, and it's the long haul larvae that are doing the feeding. So you can see down here, they're not British species, but um, it's just a nice example. Um, so the longhorn lays her eggs in the host tree, then the larvae develop. Um, they, they have a lot of host trees, actually, the number of, uh, well, a number of species like Phytosia and Agapanthia are Phytophagus, which means that they feed on plant material. Um, Agapanthia lays its eggs in hogweed and thistles, and the larvae develop in the stems. Um, one unusual form, I think, is Pseudon. Pseudon I can never say this name. This is, we're going to spend the whole of the, <laughs> the whole of this workshop with me struggling to pronounce the Latin names. <laughs> Um, Pseudodonovia, where the larvae develop in the fungal mycelia within the soil, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll flip between common names and Latin names. You'll, you'll be able to spot it when I can't say the, the Latin name properly. <laughs> um, so yeah, after the females lay their eggs, they hatch and develop into larvae. So this is a larval stage here. And uh, this can range from months to many years as a larvae, depends on the species. Um, and then once the larvae reach a suitable stage in their development, they begin to pupate, which is this section here. Look like lalians. Um, they look like kind of half between a larva and an adult. Very strange. If you ever manage to find a pupa and you, you put them on your hands, they wriggle and they just look like, they don't look like they're from this world. It's strange. Um, yeah, and once they reach the, once they pupate, they emerge as adult beetles. Uh, excuse the image of the Asian longhorn there, it was the only copyright picture I could find, I'll have to make my own, um, copyright free I mean. So once the adults emerge they're often found on flowers or recently fallen dead, um, fallen or felled timber. Um, 
some species like the house longhorn beetle, so that's Hylotrupes bedulis, can be considered a pest in households because they develop in structural timbers, um, I guess, depending on, they can be in there for a very long time, so sometimes people don't actually realise they've got them. They can be in there from anything from one to 17 years um, in terms of their development, which is a huge amount of time, so they can quite often annoy people in that sense. So there's no surprise that longhorns are sometimes considered to be insect pests. I think this is unfair, maybe I'm biased, but, um, Longhorns are really, really important in ecosystems as they provide pollination services. They, the larvae eat sort of decaying matter, so they turn around the nutrients within um, an ecosystem. So they're really important insects, but yeah, I might be a bit biased. I also like bark beetles, the scolotines, which nobody likes because they cause things like Dutch elm disease. And they're really lovely and they're just feeding. I think it's not their fault. <laughs> So we've got two species here. Um, so this is Ceramic Cerdo and Agapanthia cardui. And we quite often get lots of records of non-native species sent to us. So 99% um, of the time they're imported from wood, but the person sending us the record has either had a new bit of furniture or they're building a new structure and they've got, they've, you know, the woods come in and then we find out it was imported from somewhere like France or, this is the case with Serambic Cerdo. We quite often get um, records of this over the past four or five years. We've had quite a few records actually. Um, I'm actually just about to mount this one later today. This was sent in to us a little while ago. I've just had it soaking so I can mount it this evening. Um, I don't know if you can see that. I can show afterwards if it's not working. So that's Serambic Cerdo. It's a really big longhorn beetle. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lovely piece of wood that we've got in the museum, actually, that a farmer found in his field. And it's a huge piece of wood, like this big. And a farmer found it in his field and um, they brought it into the museum and they said, oh, we saw the tunnel hole. So obviously the farmer was worried what could be tunnelling, you know, to, causing damage to his um, land and his crops. So, yeah, they dated back the, the piece of wood to the Bronze Age and it had a specimen of Serenbic Cerdo inside of it. So we know that we used to have this wonderful species of longhorn here. Um, so when we do get, um, you know, specimens like that one that probably have come in from wood that's been imported, it's quite interesting to think, well, it was here before. So where does that stand? If it came back, is it, is it an invasive species? Is it, has it come back? There's quite a lot of discussions that people have about that. And we also have a species that is new to the British list, which is this one here. This is Agapanthia cardui. Um, it's now got an established population thriving in Kent. Um, so keep your eyes peeled up for this one in the future. You can tell the difference from our common species of Agapanthia because it's got this long white stripe down the back there. Along the suture of the elytra, that midpoint. I'm not going to say too much about how you identify the different subfamilies. Um, if anybody does want to know anything about this, pop a thing in the comments at the end and I can make sure I've got a little handout that I've written to separating the subfamilies. So pop a thing in the comment if you'd like that. But we've got prionines, spondylines, lamiines, lepturines and cerambicines. Um, so there are subfamilies that we have in the UK and all our species fall underneath them. So we'll start with our most common species. This is root pelomaculata, the black and yellow longhorn. It's got these characteristic black and yellow colouring. Um, the pattern on the elytra is really variable. Um, I've got a specimen here, and again, I, I'm not sure what you can see, so I'll just try and show you it. But So, I don't know if you can see this. I'm not sure, I can't see myself either, so I'm not sure if you can see that. But, you know, everybody always thinks of root pella as having these wonderfully yellow elytra, and sometimes you can have these really dark forms. So, it's quite interesting to know that. Um, so, yeah, it can be separated from other similar species because it has these two-toned leg color. So they've got yellow at the base, 
and black towards the tip. And then, um, yeah, like I say, just be really mindful that the color is really variable on the elytra. And it visits flowers from May through to September. You can often find it on hawthorn, um, on umbellifers, or longhorns love um, hawthorn and umbellifers. Um, so our next species is the speckled longhorn. So this can sometimes be confused with root pelomaculata due to the colour. Um, you know, at a quick glance, you can see that it would be easy to confuse them. But this species is a lot is a lot more like fatter, squatter. It's smaller, like it's it's a lot easier when you can see specimens in real life. Um, so I apologise for just the photos, but. Um, if you're unsure about the patterning, a good character to separate them is the leg colour. So they've got black legs, whereas root pallor has the two-toned yellow and black. Um, it also has black antennae as well. Um, and we created a little guide as part of the Longhorn recording scheme. And um, we've got a series of these guides available actually on our Facebook group for free. Um, I can, I'm gonna give Liana a package of ID resources at the end, so um, you can get those. Um, I've just included it here for reference, um, so that's a quick little guide to separate those two species. Now we have the wasp beetle, and as the name suggests, they look really similar to wasps at a quick glance. Um, wasp beetles are amazing to watch, as when they walk, they have this like wasp-like behaviour. So they seem to mimic the jerky walking movements um, that wasps have. So. Um, could be a predator avoidance mechanism, as many other insects mimic um, bees and wasps. So it's a very characteristic longhorn. Um, it's got the black body with the yellow sort of banding markings on it. Um, but it's got very distinctive orange legs. That's a nice character to remember, those orange legs. Um, yeah, that's our longhorn. I've got a little video to play. I don't know if this has sound. So sorry if it blares out something. And you can just see how it moves like a wasp almost. <laughs> so that was our wasp beetle. Um, so the next couple of species can be a little bit confusing at first because um, they're all sort of black and orange. But if you play, um, if you pay like, particular attention to the patterns um, with the sort of spotting on the elytra um, and the colour of the legs, you should be able to separate them. So for the first one, um, we have the six spotted longhorn, which the common name does it justice. It's got six orange spots on the elytra and they also have these black legs. So that's the two key characters for this species. The six spots, orangey red, um, and then the rest of the body is black, um, but especially the black legs. Then we have the four-banded longhorn, which um, looks very similar to the last species, but it has um, eight orange spots on the elytra. So you can see them here, one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's a nice simple difference between them there. That's not very difficult. Um, I don't know why they don't call it the eight spotted longhorn. Keeping it simple with the four, you know, anyway, common names. Um, the third of our similar looking orange and black longhorns is the golden haired longhorn beetle. And the key character for this is that they have these golden hairs on the edge edges of the pronotum here. I'll show you on this one so you can see the where I'm pointing to. So it's got this little like trim of yellowy golden hairs. And the legs are like orange brown as well. So that's a nice um, species to be able to separate. So you can distinguish the first two species by looking for the black legs, and then you can separate by counting the number of orange spots on the elytra. And then the third species um, has got these red legs and it's got a little fancy golden scarf around its neck. Um, yeah, and then we've done another little uh, guide there to separate in those. So the next two species belong to the genus called Ragium, um, and both this is the one. This is the genus I was talking about when they have the unusually small antennae for um, longhorn beetles. 
and um, this is Raglan Bifaskeletum. And the pattern and the colours on this are super um, characteristic. So they have the elytra, which is generally darker, and they have the sort of four distinctive cream white stripes across the middle there. And then these little red patches on the side. Um, you can also see these ridges that run down like, along the elytra there. So that's quite characteristic. Then we have Ragium mordax, um, which is very bland in comparison. So you can see they are quite different. Um, it has this beiged mottled like appearance with the dark patches on the elytra, as opposed to the really obvious cream and then the red. Um, the elytra is a lot smoother in this one, I think as well. Um, and they don't seem to have, they have the ridges that go down along the elytra, but they're not as like prominent as Ragium. So it kind of looks like it's rab ribbed on um, Ragium bifuscatum in comparison to Mordax. There is another species, um, Ragium inquisita, but um, it's rarer. Um, um, yeah, I don't have time to cover it today. Stenurella melanura. So now we dive into the world of red and black longhorns. Um, and of course, I should have said this before, I'm just picking a select number of species, so there are um, significantly more than what I'll be able to cover today. So don't take it that these are all the red and black ones, there's other ones that um, I may not have covered. That goes for the rest of the, um, the talk as well. But um, So Stenurella melanura, which is all black with these lovely red elytra. So this is a female here and this is a male. So the sexual dimorphism in the species, and this just means that the males and the females look slightly different from each other. And the specimen on the top, like I said, is a female. And you can see this um, sort of, I should have made this picture bigger. You can see this sort of darkened area along the suture. If you remember, the suture is that midline that goes all the way through the middle of the elytra, or where the elytra meets, sorry, that's a better way to say it. So it's sort of darkened along the suture, but spreads outwards in the female. And then the male does have this darkening along the suture as well, but it's not the same. And at the bottom as well, it seems to be a lot darker. I've got a specimen I can show you after. I'll show you specimens after if you want to see them, because then I can stop my screen sharing. It'll make everything bigger. So yeah, um, as I said before, the legs and the antennae are all black, um, and then they've got these carrot and yeah, and the pronotum as well, and these characteristic red elytra. And then we've got the fairy longhorn beetle. I can't say the Latin name properly of that. I won't try because I'll just say it wrong. Um, my old manager at the museum was used to laugh at me with my pronunciation of everything. But he's very kindly. This is Max Barkley. He's brilliant. He very kindly used to say to me, well, you know, nobody's, it's, there's no right way of saying it. <laughs> Bless him. So anyway, so this is a fairy longhorn. This is a lovely little beetle. Um, it can sometimes be mistaken for Stenurella melanura. Um, the legs in the females of the fairy longhorn are like the two-toned black and red. So that's a good character to tell them apart. If you have a male melanura that doesn't have the sort of darkened suture like we saw here um yeah and in the fairy longhorn the, the shoulders of the um elytra i don't think that's the proper term i'm not sure i might be making that up but the little edges here they tend to be very broad they're almost like rectangular that's a good character and the pronotum is more rounded as well and they tend to be quite hairy um yeah i don't know if that's a that's just something I've observed. And then our final, final sort of ready one is Stictolectura rubra. Um, it kind of looks similar to the fairy longhorn. Um, the male is the one on the left and then the female is this one here on the right. So in rubra, the, the body is more slender. Um, in comparison to the, f the fairy longhorn, if you look. They're a lot more stouter, they're smaller. Well, I think they're smaller. Um, just a bit more like compact in the fairy longhorn in comparison to Rubra. Um, 
So yeah, in the female, which is the one on the right here, it's a lot easier to tell them apart because it has this characteristic elytra, which are on the pronotum as well, which are really red. So it's very characteristic. Um, one other feature with this species is that um, the elytra tend to sort of taper to these little points a bit more than they do in um, the fairy longhorn, where you can see they're quite rounded. So that's another good character. So these points. Now we have our dusky longhorn beetle. Um, it's a large, a very large longhorn beetle, and um, it's this rusty brown colour. Um, the elytra, sorry, that's not a great photo. The elytra have these long, longitudinal ridges. You go all the way along down the elytra, and um, they have these little sort of dimples. Actually, that looks like a little face. Sorry, the child in me is coming out. Um, they have these little dimples on the pronotum, and the pronotum tends to be like you can see it's really rounded, almost like bulbous, um, as well. Let's say that's the key characters for that one. And this is one of my favourites, Stenochorus meridianus. It's quite a beastly looking longhorn. Um, it has these like really broad shoulders on the elytra. Again, I'm not sure if I'm, don't quote me by saying shoulders on the elytra. I don't know if that's an actual thing that people say. I'm just making it up. Um, everybody made things up, didn't they? So why not? Um, so it's just these broad shoulders to the elytra and they really taper down towards the end there. Um, but a really key character is these spines on the pronotum. You can't really see it very well there. So this is the pronotum. Um, just as a recap, I want to keep referring to the pronotum, that's the thorax. Um, so they have these spines here. There's another one on that side. So that's a really key character for this species. And they kind of like project outwards from the body. And they have two colour forms, this sort of lighter brown and then this dark brown, almost black really. Um, yeah, so it's quite a chunky longhorn, um, lovely to see. Another lovely longhorn, they're all lovely. Um, we have Prionus coriarius, I can never say that. I can never say most of them as you're noticing. Um, everybody knows when I, that I work with, they, they've learned my pronunciation now, so they kind of know what I mean. So it's also known as the tanner beetle. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has seen this before. It's an amazing longhorn. It's huge. I found once I found one once at Powder and Castle in Devon, and I was doing a survey there, and I couldn't believe how big it was. Um, you can't really mistake it for any other longhorn in the UK. It's the only one in this subfamily that we have. Um, it has these really characteristic spikes on the pronotum here, so they sort of spike outwards. Um, it's got these kind of evil-looking eyes here. <laughs> very similar to lots of other longhorns, but um, in particular, this species reminds me of, I don't know if anybody has seen darkling beetles before. Um, Tinny Brionids, they're called, that's the family. It's a nice one to learn actually, because they quite often mimic other beetles. Um, so it's a good one to learn, um, just in case you get caught out once. But the eyes really remind me of Tinny Brionid eyes here. We have a joke at work that we call Tenebrionid eyes, shifty looking. So it kind of has these evil looking eyes, but very, very similar to the rest of the longhorns. So yeah, generally dark and chunky, has these little spines on the pronotum there. Has these serrated toothed um, antennae, which are really chunky. I mean, lots of the longhorns, most of them, they all have these sort of serrated toothed antennae, but they're really chunky in this species. Well, this is the golden bloomed grey longhorn beetle, such a long common name. I literally can't say the second part of the Latin name for this species, Agapanthia. Um, this picture just illustrates my struggle um, perfectly. That's how my brain goes. It just feels like a whole mass of equations and horrible mental struggles when I try to say this second part of the Latin name. So. Some people can just say it just off like that. I've, I've sort of said to people, go on, you say it, and they just get it straight away. I struggle. Um, anyway, so Agapanthia has this mottled grey 
sort of golden colouring. Um, so you can see here, it's sort of like a goldeny colour, and then it's got the golden bits on the head and the pronotum as well. Um, and then it has these grey and black, or sort of like white and black, I suppose, um, striped antennae. Um, just a little note to be careful of, as they get older, sometimes they can lose their golden colouring. So they can lose some of this pubescence that gives them this like golden look. Um, so they can appear darker. We actually saw a specimen um, on a Facebook group yesterday or the day before, um, and someone was saying, oh, it's very dark, I haven't seen one that looks like this. Um, um, and a, a chap called Martin Ryszczek, who used to run the Longhorn Scheme, um, yeah, sort of pointed out that they can look really dark when they're older. So that's a nice little tip. Very um, characteristic Longhorn. It's a lovely one to see, quite often we'll find them on thistles. Um, yeah, it's probably another one of my favourites. No, this is another one of my favourites. Um, this is Phytosia cylindrica, little lambella for longhorn. It's so cute. Um, it's so tiny, very small, very slender. It's covered in these like really fine pubescents. Um, key characters are that it has these orange front legs here. And then if you remember back to our morphology diagram, I was talking about the scutellum. So it has this... Um, sort of white scutellum here. It's just very small and very characteristic, but those are the two sort of key characters I'd say. Oh, sorry, one moment. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I'd say they're the two key characters for this species. And then we've got Phimotodes testaceus, which is a, which is the town bark beetle, but it just looks like a big brute really hefty it looks like it's just been to the gym so it has these two color forms between the males and the females so they're also sexually dimorphic um both the male and the female have these like really bulbous um pronotums here so they just look really rounded and bulbous and then they have also bulbous femurs as well um it kind of looks like they have knobbly legs again that's not very scientific but a nice way to remember um, yeah, very, very characteristic. Um, yeah, I don't, there wouldn't really, you wouldn't need any other key characters for that. Bulbous pronotum, really enlarged femurs, um, and they have the two colour forms to remember. So, these are our Gramoptera species. There's two um, that I'm going to cover today. Um, so, people tend to find these quite tricky to separate but you can't see it in this photo, but if you look at the shape of the second antennal segment, you should be able to split them apart. So Gramoptera rufricornis, which is this one here. So it tends to have um, more of an elongate second antennal segment. So it would be, you can't see it on this picture, but it would be this one here. Um, I should have enlarged that really. Um, so that tends to have more of an elongate second antennal segment, whereas Adobinalis has a more rounded second antennal segment, so it's more rounder in shape. Size isn't usually um, a good character to rely on. Um, for many beetles, quite often we probably usually say don't always rely on size because they can vary so much within um, a species. However, and this isn't a character that is written in books, I don't think, but me and Will have looked at quite a few specimens and we seem to think that abdominalis is significantly bigger across the board than Rufocornis. But maybe don't use that as a strict rule. We might be wrong, we may have just seen all the big ones. <laughs> um, but we think, well, we were, you know, bef years ago before we'd like seen enough of them, we were always going by this antennal character. And then after a while, and when I'd looked in the collections, I was like, oh. and Will um, was actually the one that suggested this to have a look. He was like, they're a lot bigger. So I went and had a look and they really are. So I think abdominalis is a lot bigger um, than Rufocornis. So that's quite a good character, but don't quote this on it too much. <laughs> and then we've done another little um, guide there. So it does show you, um, in more detail those two, two antennal features that you can see. 
Oh, sorry. There we go. So, Anaglyptus mysticus is another lovely longhorn. I think this is another one of my favourites. I've got lots of favourites. So it's red and black with this sort of white patterning on the elytra. Um, so you can see the tips of the elytra here are really white. Then it has this like unusual pattern in the middle. It's kind of, yeah, white and black swirl. like. And then the top here is red. Um, it also has these sort of two-toned sort of white with little black bits on the antennae. Um, very characteristic. Um, the only species you really confuse it with is the white banded longhorn beetle. Um, it's somewhat similar, um, but it's much, much smaller. This species is really small. It lacks the white tips to the uh, um, tips of the elytra and it's sort of got less patterning on the middle, which is, it is different, but at a quick glance, if you were to just flick through a book, you might go, oh, it's that one, and get it confused with um, Mysticus. Um, the antennae are also sort of this reddish brown, um, yeah, as are the legs as well. So we've got the black legs here, and then we've got the reddish brown legs here. So they are very different, but sometimes we get those sent in and they're misidentified. And then, yeah, we've got um, our Pognacheris. I love these, they're so lovely. Really small, um, they're tiny little longhorns. Um, so we've got two species. So we've got Pognacheris hispidulis and we've got Pognacheris hispidus. And how you separate them is Pognacheris hispidulis has this white scutellum, so that Oh, actually you can, I've enlarged it there. So it's got this white scutellum there, whereas Hispidus has the black scutellum here. And then also you can count the little spines on the tips of the elytra. So there's one, two, three, four spines there, whereas Hispidus has just two. So it's really easy to separate those, but they are very small. Um, I'm not so was someone saying something to me then? Or was it just someone's microphone? I'll carry on. Um, so that's sort of our key ones. I think I'm going way over time, so um, I'll have to speed up a bit. <laughs> um, so where to find longhorn beetles? So adult longhorn beetles can be found, um, well, actually they can be both easy and tricky to find. So sometimes if you find the right patch, you can find tons of them and sometimes you just will see nothing. So both Will and I have run longhorn workshops and we've desperately tried to find them and we found like one, one individual um, of a really common species. Um, so they tend to emerge from around April through to August, although some species can be found as early as March, some as late as September. Um, yeah, a few species can be found all year round as adults, so ragium species can be found all year. The adult beetles tend to be found feeding on um, flowers of hawthorn, dogwood, hogweed. They love umbellifers. Um, they also love hawthorn blossom. So we've got, yeah, our umbellifers here and hawthorn blossom here. Um, so that's a really good spot to start in the spring when the hawthorn blossom comes out. Have a little look on there. You'll find lots of Gramoptera, <laughs> um, how to collect them um, when you're trying to find them. So using a sweep net or a beating tray is a really useful method for collecting them. So that's our sweep net there and our beating trays are here. So using a beating tray um, when the hawthorn blossom is out is a great way to find longhorns. Um, like I said, you just simply use a stick to collect the lo to bash the hawthorn blossom and then you collect the long thorn, long ones that um, fall off underneath onto the beating tray. You don't even have to have an actual proper beating tray like this either. You can be inventive. You can use an umbrella or you can put um, a sheet underneath. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, pot your longhorn up when you find it in a pot, something like this. You can use a jam jar. You can use anything, be inventive. Um, yeah, and then, like I said earlier, if you pop a bit of tissue in with them, or even some of the, oh, my laptop is about to die. Sorry. 
um, if you pop a piece of tissue in or if you get some of the blossom even just something so that they can hold on to something so I've got a little wasp beetle in here it just allows you to then see them clearer they tend to stay still um, it just makes it easier um, and then you can use a hand lens like I said earlier so like this one here um, and you can see most of the features um, for the most part there's a couple of species yeah there's, there's a few species that you would need to take home and you know use a microscope to identify um, I did have an example of a couple of other species which I took out because the talk was getting too long but for example like um, Leopus which I think I put an example in. So Leopus is a grey mottled beige grey type longhorn and that's very very difficult to separate the species, the two species we have. So we tend to just mark that as Leopus um, but you can um, dissect the genitalia to identify them, that's the, that's the only accurate way to do it but it's still really difficult. Um, so yeah for some cases you'd need to uh, yeah, take a voucher specimen if you if you really wanted to record it, but for the most part, you can just identify them in here. Um, so what to do with your records when you have them? So if you spot um, longhorns, it's always good to take note of the record. The most important information is to sort of note where you found them, when you found them and who found them. And um, like I said, many, many of the species can be identified with a hand lens, which means you can just release them after you've um, taken your photograph, always take a photograph, um, as many angles as possible. Um, we quite often get really blurred photos or ones from really far away. And sometimes it's just useful to have a couple of angles and try and get the specimen, as the, the, the longhorn in clear view. Um, and then, you can use iRecord to send your records in. I'm not sure how many people have, are familiar with iRecord, but it's a fantastic website for sharing and recording wildlife observations. So you input your data into the system and then it collates it and sends it over to the rele relevant recording schemes. They have an app for it, which is great, which is obviously an example here. Um, it's just a great way to send your records in. It's quick, you can take a picture on the app, pop all the information in there, it finds the location of where you are. It's so simple, much better than sending spreadsheets and writing your records down that way. Um, very efficient. So we decided to use our record to collate most of our records for the scheme. Um, and we prefer to use the records, well, we prefer our records to come in this way. Um, it's a lot more efficient um, than using traditional spreadsheets, like I said, on Excel. So once you've got your record, you can upload the information and then it will find its way to us, um, whatever recording scheme, whatever you're, you're recording. But if it's a longhorn, it will find its way to our schemes um, data set. And then we can use it and look at it for um, looking at species distributions. We can create maps like this one here. Um, so this one is for Agapanthia. I won't say the second part of its name. <laughs> It allows us to collate all of this data in one place, so um, it's very user friendly and you can download it in the app, like I said, or use it on your computer. Um, yeah, it's just really useful for us to sort of look at long term trends within species. So what's common now may not be common in 20 years time. Um, for whatever reason, there may be land use change or, um, you know, development and all sorts of things affect all of our wildlife so um, if we have records of all the common things the rare things just everything that you see then over a long period of time it allows us to look at the trends between species better and obviously then it allows us to make better conservation plans for declining species um, or trying to if we see that a common species is starting to decline in a certain area we can ask questions about okay what what's happening in that area is there land use change what's going on so we've got, well, in terms of ID guides, we've got um, our FSC guide. So Will and I created this and um, we've got Richard Lewington's illustrations in there. Um, it's a nice little starting point to the common species. I um, can't remember how many we've done in there. It's not all of them. It's about half of them. Um, 
so it's got illustrations and then it's got like a key table of ID features at the back as well. And it's really cheap. It's like £3.50. I promise this isn't a shameless little plug of go buy our guide because <laughs> we don't really make anything from it at all. It was just for the love of doing it to get people interested in longhorns. Um, and then there's the free ID guides we've got. I got with that we've got on our Facebook group and I'll send those around afterwards. If you wanted to get a little bit more in depth with taxonomy, um, then Mike Haxton's website is a really good starting point. So um, it's not just good for longhorns. So he's got all of the beetle families on there, lots of flies, there's all sorts on there. Um, and this will take you through um, most of the, yeah, like pretty much all the taxonomic details and find morphological characters for each subfamily, genus and the species as well. So um, if you want to really get into longhorns and really understand all the characters and the morphology, it's a really good, good website. If you just Google Mike Haxton insect keys, that's the first one that comes up. It's a great website and you'll end up getting distracted by all the other beetle families too. So have a good look. He, he, what he's done is he's taken all the texts that are really difficult, um, full of really challenging language. There is still challenging language in these, but he sort of simplified some things updated the taxonomy so you don't get confused when somebody has changed the name of a species so it doesn't confuse you. Um, there is also <clears throat> a Royal Entomology Society longhorn key but it's really old and it's quite difficult to use but it does work for most of the species but like I say some of the language is really challenging and old and um, some of the taxonomy so the names of the species are old so they've changed so it can be quite confusing when you're starting out but like I say just get to grips with the um if you're a beginner just get to grips with the FSC guide um what else is there just any of your sort of normal insect guides will have a couple of the like common longhorns in um there's a Colin was it Collins no I don't think it was Collins guide uh, I'll grab that book in a minute that I'm trying to refer to. I should have kept it in here. Um, there's a book called Beetles, um, and that's a really nice starting point. I'll go grab it in a minute. Um, social media. Um, so we're really active on social media. We try to be really active on social media. Sorry, I should be truthful there. Um, so we've got a Facebook group and a Twitter. Um, do check them out especially the Facebook group because that's um, that just runs itself because everybody just posts their pictures. They say, I found this longhorn. If they know what it is, they'll say, or they'll say, I don't know what this longhorn is. Could I have some help? And there's a lovely little community there that um, everybody helps each other with identifying their longhorns. We've got all our free guides in there. Um, and we just generally sort of update things in there quite a lot. Um, same with the Twitter, but the longhorn group is a bit more, um, everybody can interact with each other a bit more on the, the longhorn group in terms of identification on a post, I think. Websites, just a quick mention of the two websites that might be useful. Um, this is a great website. Um, actually, I should have, I only use this by a link. I'll include a little document with all these resources in afterwards and then you can get the link for this or you can try and remember that long name there. Um, this isn't just British species, but it's a really good website for getting lots of pictures and just seeing how all the different um, subfamilies are arranged and which species are in which subfamily. You can see all the names and things together. So that's a really good website. For British species, there's the UK beetle recording website. There's lots of images on there, not just for longhorns, all British beetles, it's great. We've got a little bit of information on our page there. Um, you can click down on these little sort of tabs there and tells you a bit more info about longhorns. And then it's got lots of examples there. So it's a really good website actually, if you're just trying to learn beetle families. So you can go on, I think it's either this tab or this tab, I can't remember, but one of these two tabs here, the beetles or beetle recording. And then it's got all the families and you can just get a feel for how the different families look. So yeah, just try and guess the species. You can write in the comments.
I don't know if any comments came up. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of people saying speckled. Yeah, well done. So it's a speckled longhorn. So it's got these black legs. And it's stopped on a bit of an awkward um, frame there, but it's got the black legs there. And then it's got that sort of more squished up. It's not very scientific, but it's more squished up, stouter body shape. Um, and just the general different pattern on the elytra. And those black antennae as well. Sorry, it double plays videos. I don't know how to get it to stop doing that. Any ideas about this little chappy? I haven't left any of the names on some of the pictures or something. <laughs> Think about the patterns on the elytra and colouring. So we've got a couple saying Ragia Mordax. Yeah, well done. So it's got that duller appearance in comparison to Ragium bifuscatum, which has the two really distinctive um, lines of the creamy white stripes and then the red patches in between. So whereas this species is just gem generally duller, <laughs> more beige, it's a bit mean, isn't it? Um, and then it also is a bit smoother in appearance, doesn't have those like really strong um, ridges down the, the elytra. What about this one? One of our red and black longhorns. Not got any answers just yet. <laughs> I don't think I've seen a, a longhorn with, with mites on it before, Katie. Do you see them? Oh, do you know what? I didn't even spot there was mites there. Here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well spotted, Gary. No, to be fair, I haven't. I've never seen one when I've collected one. Um, God, you poor dung beetles. They get, the, they get all the bloody mites, don't they? Sorry. Um, <laughs> they get all the mites. Um, well, they're helpful to sylphids, aren't they? They're, it's it's a... Uh, it's, a, it's like a um, commensual relationship, isn't it? Yeah, yeah they work together. <laughs> yeah, yeah we've got yeah. a couple of answers. We've got fairy ring, tan bark, and black striped. Okay. I'm not sure if the Latin overlaps with some of the common names there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so this one is Stictolectra rubra. So this is the one that can be, so we've got our, I, when I was first learning, I found the red and black longhorns the most difficult to get my head around because I would go back and forth with them. So, um, so this is a male. So this is the one that we can confuse easily with Stenurella, Stenurella melanura. Um, so, and also quite similar to the fairy longhorn as well. So if we look at the shoulders of this one, they're not as broad as the fairy longhorn. Um, go back and get a picture of it. Should have put a picture in the next slide. So this is our fairy longhorn. So you can see the shoulders are just a lot more broader and they do have this little like hairiness to them. Don't quote me on that specific hairiness thing. Let me just check the other doesn't have it. That's something I always think about. So yeah, they do both tend to have that hairiness to be fair but it's more the broadness of the shoulders. And then in, so the fairy longhorn has like these more rectangular broad shoulders. And then it has like more rounded tips to the print, uh, to the elytra, whereas they're more tapered here. Um, I can't Does this one have a common name? I actually don't know what the common name is. I, I've, I flip between common names and Latin names to as it suits me to what I remember. This is the red longhorn beetle. That's as it says on the tin. Um, where were we? There we go. So yeah, that's our stick to lecture rubra. Next one. And 
golden bloomed grey from Chloe? This was a bit mean of me. This is a kind of a tricky one because yes, it, it would be the the are normal common native species. This is the one that I mentioned has been introduced. So this is Agapanthia cardioi. So similar to the golden bloom Agapanthia, um, this species is recently is the one that's recently appeared in the UK. So we can separate our two. Let me get the other picture up so you can just compare them actually. So this is our this is our common species that you're referring to. So you can see there's no sort of um, white line down the, the midpoint of the elytra and it's got that general sort of goldeny sheen to it in comparison to this one here. So it's got that white line going all the way down. And I have seen other specimens of this, mostly fire pictures, tend to be a lot darker, I find. Um, but I don't, I would use this character if the white line going down the middle is the key character. Maybe take the colouring with a pinch of salt. So that was mean of me, sorry. Um, but yes, very similar obviously because they both look very, very similar. What about this little one? One of my favourites. Look at those front legs. If you can see them actually, they're quite well camouflaged. We've got Umbella for long haul. Yeah, Phytosia cylindrica. So yeah, like I said, looking at those little orange legs, the front legs are just orange. And actually you can't really see it very well in this picture, but that scutellum, that little triangle bit there is always white. And it's tiny, you can't really see that from this picture, but if you saw them in real life, they're very small. Another little video. It's just so nice watching videos of beetles. What do you reckon, guys? I think people have sussed you out. Um, fake, fake legged <laughs> flower beetle. <laughs> well done. Just trying to be mean. <laughs> you, out. you guys are too good for me. <laughs> oh, I don't know why it does that. It clicks onto um, the video twice. Fairy ring. Yeah. Quite a few people getting that one. <laughs> yeah, well done. So yeah, we got these broad shoulders and to the elytra. And then we got the sort of rounded tips to the elytra as well. And I just think it is hairier. I know they're both hairy, um, rubra and ones that people get confused with, but I think this one's hairier. Um anyway, let's go to the next one. What about this little chappy? I've referenced all these videos and pictures, right? We don't get done for. <laughs> <laughs> Got black and yellow. Anything else? Yep. <laughs> yes, this is root pelomaculata. So it's got those two toned yellow and black legs. It's quite a good common name for it. And then it's got the black patterning on the elytra as well. Um, the, an the antennae are also two-toned, actually. We can't see that in this picture. Next one. Oh, it's a video, I'm sorry. We'll just watch the video for fun. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Wow, 
about this one. Good feature is look at the legs and look at the pronotum. We've got a few people saying six foot and four banded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so these are the ones gold that gold as well. <laughs> these are the ones that get um, commonly confused. So this is Lectura Ariolenta. So it's our one, two, three, four banded. I think they should just call it the eight spotted. I don't know about everyone's opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you get common names changed. Can you get common names changed? I'll fight for that because I think if the common name can hint towards the ID, it's great. So it's got obviously the 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 number of the spots here so we've got the eight spots and then we've got this like little golden scarf a little golden trim of um, pubescence on the sort of edges of the pronotum there and then it's also got the orange and red legs so the other two species that we talked about have got the black legs um, and then obviously the patterns are different about this little chappy So for the, there's two that we have that are, we're going to try and separate with these ones. If you look at that scutellum, so the scutellum is that little triangle bit there. So this is one of the key points and the number of the spines it has here is also key. So you've got someone saying greater form and then hispidus and pub. Pogo on Chirus Hispidus. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Lesser tips and Pogo Chirus Hispidus. Yeah, yeah, so this is Pognachirus Hispidus. So it's got the black scutellum and then it's got the two spines here, whereas Pognachirus Hispidulus, they should have made the name slightly different, um, has the white scutellum and then it has four little spines here. I think this is the last one. Where's it going? Probably wasn't much point in putting this one in. You guys are too good. Oh, how cute is it? Okay, we've got Camfarid from Chloe. Yeah. Soldier beetle, Asian hornet from Richard, but I think he might be joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to catch him out. Um, and obviously, with the the Eda married the flower beetle and the soldier beetle, if it he obviously can't count the legs, why it's moving like that. But with with a lot of things, it is good to try and get your eye in over time for just generally how things look. So um, obviously, when you're up when you get a bit more practice, if you're a beginner, you won't always be counting all these little features all the time, but it's always good to have these features, of course, to begin with, because however are you gonna learn if you can't separate them? Um, so yeah, that's the end of the quiz. Okay, well, um, yeah, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, that, was a, that was a really good introduction to the group, and uh, I'm sure it will inspire some people to, to get out and start recording them. I, I just I just think they're brilliant because um, you know you can just just take photos and you can identify most of them. Yeah. And and as you pointed out, which is which is really useful and it's gonna be great to send people the links, but there's so many sort of resources that you can go to to, to help your ID as well as as the Facebook page. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I would I um I I've never heard of that um Prionus um, longhorn. So I, so I, so I had a quick. I looked it up in uh, in Duff <laughs> just now, and I, um, I don't know if it occurs in Lancashire and Cheshire. 
um, but it says it's it's passing and declining. But it also says it goes up to uh, the largest size, forty five mil. So I think yes, yeah, so that's really big. I mean, a female stag beetle goes up to about fifty. I think. I think males go up to about seventy five. So I mean, it's one of the one of the larger British beetles, isn't it? Yeah, it's a little beast. When I saw it at Powderham Castle, I was like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, it was in a trap, so. So I don't think, I mean, I don't think, it, it was common around here. I, I don't think people would, uh, would you know, pass it by, really, something like that. Mm -hmm. so. Out of curiosity, um, mind you, if everybody starts putting in the comments where, <laughs> roughly where they're from, I'm just curious to know where everybody is from. It'd be nice to know who's... You know, if we have people from across the country here, um, I, I, think, I think we do. I think we do. But um, going by some of the names, but there's also a lot. Of, uh, yeah, a strong northwest contingent. I can. Yeah, of course, with the project. Lots of names. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. So, any questions? Be kind. Okay, I'll 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 start from the from the first question. So I've I've gone back through the chat, and I'll I'll go I'll go through them. Um, but I, I just, just while I, I think of it, um, the Keith Alexander did a, did a review of the Longhorns last mm -hmm. year, didn't he? Which is published on the, this is one of the Natural England status reviews. Yeah, the so, so I was just, um, I, I was just thinking that's, that's, an, that's another Im important thing which your records contribute to, mm -hmm. actually understanding the, the, the most recent conservation status for all for all the species. I think on, on that list I was looking at there's, there's a couple of critically endangered species, one endangers and, and there's things that have changed their status from what they were yeah. uh, from the previous review. And and all that will all those status review those changes and what we know now is will all be based on, you know, mostly on volunteer effort, won't it? Yeah, absolutely. Gosh. I think um all pretty much on volunteer effort um well obviously we have county recorders and people like that that are continuously mon monitoring you know all species but i mean we we wouldn't have the understanding without volunteer effort at all it's so important um and uh yeah when we were when we took the scheme over will and i we really pushed for i record um because it's easier, it just all comes to one place. We still do accept um, spreadsheets and things, but um, it's a bit of a faff, so we like iRecord. But after about, I think it was about a year and a half taking the scheme over, we popped all of, well, Will did actually, Will um, looked at all the records and then we sat and looked at them on maps and we were amazed at the changes in distributions from like the old Atlas. So we're waiting to get you know, a good couple of years worth of um, data in, and then we're hoping to get a new atlas out so you'll be able to see where things have changed, where they're occurring now, um, difference in species distributions. So, yeah, so I think I'm up for the tangent then. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and the other thing I was thinking, maybe, maybe when we put the YouTube video on, in the description, we can put the links as well to resources. That, oh, that, yeah, that good would be good, idea. wouldn't it? Yeah, as well as sending them out to everybody. Yeah, um, good, yeah. Okay, I'll I'll start. I'll, I'll make a start then on these questions. So a question from Chloe um, was: Do all longhorns have hidden tarsals? Have a hidden tarsal segment? So technically, um, yeah. So they all have this hidden tarsal segment. And I, when I was learning, um, when I was looking at this, trying to find this hidden tarsal, hidden tarsal segment, I've never been able to see it. Other people say they can see it. So have a, if you have a microscope or if you go somewhere that you can look at a microscope, do you, I don't know, um, what does the museum offer that sort of access, Gary? Um, absolutely. Um, well, <laughs> it will do. Oh, again. sorry, I just got, <laughs> go to the museum. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, you know, anyone, uh, uh, just talking about World Museum here, um, Anyone can book with with Tony Hunter, the assistant creator of entomology, to come and uh, you know spend all day in the museum. You can you can you can be there full time if you like, looking at beetles. Um, you know it's it's a publicly funded museum, so uh, come and use the microscopes and look at beetles all day if you like every day, uh, apart from the weekends <laughs> when we're not there. 
The same goes um, for the Natural History Museum. So if anybody ever wants to, if anybody's local to London or you're in London for a weekend and you fancy, uh, or, or the week actually is probably better, um, um, and you fancy looking at some beetles and you want to go through some of these features, um, we've got the British collection as well. So you're more than welcome to come and have a little look. We've got loads of resources. And if I'm around, I can help. Um, but it, I would say um, if you have, sorry, the reason I'm talking about museums is if you have a microscope, that's the only way you'll probably be able to see that um, if you can see it. I really struggle to see it personally. But yes, they all have this hidden tarsal segment. Um, but most of the books, which is something that confused me, will always refer to them as having five segments per leg. But you can kind of just see four. So just bear that in mind when you're if you get interested in um, beetles in general, and if you look at the, the beetle family key, I should have brought that with me, um, and that will refer to them having the correct number of tarsi in terms of five. So just be careful um, with that, because it can be tricky. It says to look for the hidden tarsal segment, and I don't think it's possible. I so think I it think has five in there. Sorry. Sorry, yeah, the, the, I think the next question, I think you've answered it really in that one, because Richard, Dawson was saying, is the hidden fourth tarsal segment underneath the third segment so it can be seen from below? Yeah, from below, sorry, I should have said that. It's from below, so you have to flip them over. And then um, I think it says in the in the book, if you've got a smaller specimen, like popping a bit of water on them can help, but I don't know, I've never tried it. Have a go though, if you have a microscope. Um, and yeah, if you can see them and you can get a picture of it, I don't know if anybody's I try and take pictures down the microscope just with my phone like that and um, get a picture of it and pop it on the Facebook group. I'd love to see if people can see it properly. Maybe I haven't made enough effort to see it because I just thought, well, it looks like, I just know it's four, it looks like four. That's good enough for me. Um, and then the next question um, is from Anno, who is asking about, have we had lots of reclassification? I'm old. And, and some of these are familiar, but new names to me, mm. as in Leptura quadrimaculata. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've had quite a lot of name changes and I will imagine there may be name changes to come. This is the problem with taxonomy. Um, taxonomists, so the people that study taxonomy and do all the studying of the morphology and create the names, you know, you know anyone, that is a taxonomist can if they if they justify their reasons for it can split or group things together so things will move and change around and you're right names have changed that's why i don't recommend using the um the royal entomology society key alone it's an absolutely fantastic resource and i would definitely say have a look at it because it's great but it's got old language and a lot of the names have changed in there so it can be quite confusing to then having to Google it and figure out what the new name is and remembering that and not then calling it the old name by accident. I do that with a lot of um, beetle family names um, as they change, especially within, um, I don't know if anybody likes weevils, but taxonomy changes all the time with time within the weevils. So things get split and grouped and sorry, digressing. Um, a question from Caroline is, did you say there were the, the guides are on the Facebook page? Yeah, they're on the Facebook page and we're gonna do some new ones as well and update them slightly because we made those when we first started. So I think we can make them easier to understand and add a couple of extra features into some of them. So go grab them. But I think within the next couple of months, keep your eye out because I think I'll upload new ones. I'll keep the old ones there. I'll just call them version one and then I'll upload the new ones as version twos. Um, but they're on the Facebook group, yeah. We Thanks, Katie. Enough, uh, I will. I will give people a chance to to follow up on their questions if there seems to be if there if, if it seems like there is a follow up opportunity uh, within the question. So the so the next question is from Vanessa. Could you give us an idea of the range of sizes in millimeters and centimeters, and a recommendation of which diameter? As if, I, I I mean. I think you mean which magnification of, of hand lens would be most useful? So, this is just a times 10. It doesn't have it. This is a times 10. Um, a times 10 hand lens and a times 20. You sometimes get the ones that are combined. They may be like, I don't know, £10 more, but then you've got both of them. So you have the option to look. 
what I'm trying to say is the times 10 is great for most things, but sometimes you need the times 20 just to have a look at the extra features. You might have a, for example, this is a very small um, wasp beetle. It's not as big as the usual one. So it was a bit tricky to see the tarsi on it. Um, I was just trying to look yesterday to make sure what I was saying was correct. Um, so I think it's good to have both. If you can find a combined hand lens, that's great. Um, in terms of, um, would it be useful, maybe it would be useful for us to pop a little document on the Facebook group with um, the sizes of the spits, this different species. Actually, I don't know if anybody has seen the British Wildlife, you can still buy it, I think. It's an old copy of British Wildlife and there's a guide in that and I think that has the, the sizes of them. Um, but I mean, when I'm updating some of the stuff, it's no problem for me to create a folder, uh, a file, sorry, with all the different sizes. Would that be useful? Is that what is, is that answering your question? I do tend to ramble on. I do mean diameter, not magnification. Okay, sorry, sorry, Vanessa. Okay. Yeah, That's absolutely. I can create that for you. Yeah, I'll um, give me a little while. And, and just a basic guide of how small they can be to how big. So, how, I mean, they get the smallest goes down. They're just a few mils, some of them, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And then up to, you know, you've got your, yeah, Prionus, which is a, a beast. Um, There's a massive range in there, really, isn't there? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll move on to, to Tara, who is, is saying, is iRecord usable abroad? Or what would you use in Europe when on holiday? Well, I, I would just say to that that um, no, I don't. I think iRecord is a UK um, application and, and, and website. Um, it's, it's run by the Biological Records Centre, which is a, a UK institution. What's the um, other one that you can use in? Yeah, iNaturalist, I was going to say. That, that's a worldwide yeah. um, biological recording. Uh, app, I think an app and, and a website there, and that, so I would, I would recommend that. Yeah. Um, um, I can't think of any others. I mean, there's, there's some other apps which are probably worldwide, but. Uh, yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. Also, hi Steve from Exmouth. You're just around the corner. <laughs> I'm in Newton Abbott. <laughs> um. Okay. Next. Um, Next question is from uh, Roy Lowry. Do you harvest records from iNaturalist? So the scheme, with the right? scheme, no, we, I don't think so. I think we just take our spreadsheet data. We've got obviously all the historical data. Um, and then we just take from iRecord. I don't think that filters in to iRecord. Do you know about that, Gary? Um, I don't think it does, does it? I, I, think, I think so far, as, as far as I know, the, the only iNaturalist stuff that's gone into iRecord is from those, um, those big weekends where they do the, um, have competition, the city challenge, yeah. city nature challenge. But yeah. I'm, 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 in, I'm in a few email threads where there's lots of sort of discussions around this and, and whether that'll happen in the future, I, I don't know. There's, a, there's obviously a lot of uh, useful data in, in the iNaturalist and it's very popular. Absolutely. So uh, I, I do hope everything can come together <laughs> at some time. Yeah. Um, um, Dan. Hey, Dan. Yeah, you said about the Brock's Field Guide is a really good um, resource for Longhorns. Perfect. Thank you for putting that down. Um, um, and then I think we're yeah I think we're all the way down to Amelia's question. Which of the Longhorns that we are most likely to see in Cheshire, Lancashire area are you able to identify without dissection? Um, I mean I I don't think myself from recording in Lancashire, Cheshire I don't think I've seen that many species. And I do a lot of, I, I, and I use a beating tray a lot. I mm. probably only, I would have to, I would have to go back through my records, but I was probably less than 10, I would thought, that I've actually <laughs> seen. 
I can create a little document as well for that specifically, because I guess, like you say, most people are from up your neck of the woods. So I can, again, create a little document, um, maybe get some maps together. Would that be useful? Yeah, that, again, that, that, that would be the, really useful. I could put that on, on the website as well. As a, yeah, no problem. As a resource with the size me. guide and that. Just give me a couple of weeks. Yeah, no, no, that would be brilliant. And in, and in terms of dissection, I know Leopas uh, are a bit of a devil, aren't they? And, and they they definitely are in Cheshire and Lancashire. Yeah, they're definitely a dissection jobby, and I I don't feel confident myself with them. I there's a paper that was written, and it shows you the genitalia. They've got fantastic images, but I still really struggle with it. Um, I know Will does as well, and I've spoken to other people at the museum. None of us feel fully confident, um, but equally, it's very important to get those records because otherwise, if we, you know, if it's too challenging and we just miss them. Um, but the, course, uh, sorry. sorry, Katie. No, no, don't worry. What are you going to say? With with Leopis, it, it was a, it's a fairly recent split, isn't it? Yeah. In, and and that's why in in the museum, actually, I think they're. They will all they'll all be under one species because that was the yeah. So if someone really gets into them and wants to come and identify all the ones at the museum that are probably yeah. under the old name, yeah, gosh, they haven't been sorted out yet. I'm sure they haven't. Yeah, That's a great idea. Um, yeah, and I can have a chat with Max Barkley and Martin Reischek about their tips and suggestions um, about how we go forward with that because yeah, we shouldn't really ignore it. That's something that we should get sorted out really um it's just challenged me and i've sort of just looked away from it i suppose um but yeah and i think that's a great idea getting someone to have a little look if anybody wants to get involved um yeah so i'm just staring at the other questions um i can't see i can't see any more questions i think if um if we do spot any questions in there that haven't been answered, I can always write a little answer thingy, answer document. Um, so yeah, You've obviously been very comprehensive there, Katie. But it was, it was, uh, yeah. No, I hope it. It was hard to get the balance between um, making it too simple, and making it too hard. So there's lots of common species I've missed, of course. Um, but uh, obviously, I don't want to just bore you by <laughs> going on and on and on because it's nice to see them. So when life is slightly more normal, maybe we can do another one and we can be in real life and we can go out in the field and look for them and that would be nice. That, that would be great. Um, but everyone, I just think everyone should just, just take photos of everything and, and give them a go. Yeah, uh, and send them into our record. Yes, absolutely. Um, equally, um, I can send the, there's the Longhorn, uh, Longhorns at, BRC, I don't actually know what it is off the top of my head, but there's the Longhorn email. Feel free to send us questions on there. We're a little bit rubbish at checking it often, so you're more than welcome to send them to my normal email, which is k.parts, k.potts, at nhm.ac.uk. So feel free to ask me lots of Longhorn questions, and when I get some free time, I'll answer them. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I think we'll we'll leave it there then. Thank you so much, Katie, and uh, uh, hopefully lots more people as well will see the recording on YouTube as well, and uh, it'll, it'll kick people off a, a lifelong interest in, in Longhorns. Yeah, I think so, it's so,